So welcome to our session on international security, energy security, and the energy transition. I'm Joe Aldi. I'm a professor at Harvard Kennedy School and thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate this session. Energy security has been described as, quote, a term whose meaning seems transparent but resists precise definition, in part because the meaning is not immediately obvious and in part because the meaning seems to expand as time goes on. We will explore what energy security means today in the context of evolving great power relations, technological innovation, which is transforming both the economics and the politics of the way we produce and consume energy, and the generally, although I would note not universally agreed upon imperative of decarbonizing the modern global economy. To help us unpack these issues, I'm thrilled to have three good friends with me today to discuss these issues. So first, on my far right, we have Kelly Sims Gallagher, academic dean and professor of energy and environmental policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She also directs the Climate Policy Lab and the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at Fletcher. Professor Gallagher previously served as a senior policy advisor in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and as a senior, senior China advisor to the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the State Department. Second, we have David Goldwyn, who is the president of Goldwyn Global Strategies, an international energy advisory consultancy, and chairman of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center's Energy Advisory Group. Mr. Goldwyn has served as special envoy and coordinator for international energy affairs at the State Department and as the assistant secretary of energy for international affairs. And finally, my colleague Megan O'Sullivan, who is the Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of the Practice of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm very excited to say, effective July 1, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. <coughs> Professor O'Sullivan currently serves as a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Board to Secretary Antony Blinken, and she previously served as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan in the White House. I'll get the conversation going with our panelists, uh, but we will save time uh, during the one hour that we have together for you uh, to also ask questions of our panel. We will close at 3.30 sharp, uh, as some people have other engagements they need to go to. I, for one, will be staying here for the next panel. Uh, so I will be sticking around, but others will need to leave. But first, let's get the conversation going as we think about the reemergence on the policy scene of the discussion and the need to address energy security. In fact, as we look over the past year and a half, we could fairly say that the concept of energy security has been catapulted to the forefront of policy and political conversation harkening back to the period of the 1970s. Let me first turn to my colleague, Megan. To what extent are we grappling with the known, sort of familiar challenges, and to what extent is this different this time? Um, good afternoon, and uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Joe for joining us um, at, at relatively short notice, and I've never heard his talk show voice. <laughs> yeah, very impressive. I feel like we should be on radio. Uh, but it's great to, to have you all here and to be discussing these issues. And I would say, um, you know, as we talk about energy security, nowadays it'll be possible for us to really talk about it without talking about the transition in climate security at the same time. But I do think um, you quoted someone at the beginning, but I don't know who you quoted. Uh, who was that? about how energy security is a concept yeah, that is I'd more expensive. I have to go back to my notes from okay. early this morning when I pulled okay. that up. Well, yes. I'm sure the internet can tell us Yes. That. But um, I think that's true. Uh, uh, you know, we have no doubt that energy security has become front and center in the conversations, the global conversations, the geopolitical conversations, um, particularly the last 18 months since Russia invaded Ukraine and, and spurred uh, big changes in the energy system. And I think we do all kind of have a certain familiarity with the concept, but the reality is the concept is very different than the one that we were grappling with in the 1970s. We were worried about energy security, but it was mostly in the context of a very different geopolitical landscape and one in which we were largely concerned about um, you know, a group of, of producers in the Middle East potentially weaponizing oil in order to advance political agendas. So we're in a very different world. There's some similarities, but now energy security has, I would say, a much larger 
set of reasons driving energy insecurity. There is great power competition in the system, and that has definitely made energy security a much more poignant um, issue if you think about the weaponization of energy that we've seen from uh, Putin in this conflict. Like, this is a new chapter. We've seen, um, and, and as well as the, the great power rivalry that is uh, fueling energy security, there are a couple of other factors. One is climate change itself, that as the climate warms, more and more forms of energy, not just oil, but more and more forms of energy are more vulnerable. And again, the last year and a half has showed us that in spades. If we look at France and the warm weather and how that has made it difficult to cool nuclear reactors, or if we look at droughts and how that has created uh, energy insecurity around the sources of, of hydropower. So climate change itself is going to create new kinds of energy insecurity. And then we have the whole new dimension of supply chain restructuring, which is a, a dominant force in the global economy now. And that has made um, <coughs> big questions around energy security again, not just related to oil or natural gas, but having a lot to do with clean energy technologies. Um, and I'm thinking of critical minerals, but it's not exclusive to critical minerals. It may end up um, you know, encompassing things like solar technologies, as China is considering potential export controls on some of its technologies in that sphere. So I guess I'll just wrap up by saying it sounds familiar, but in fact, there are totally different drivers of energy security <coughs> than when policymakers last took that as an issue, you know, front and center on their policymaking desks. So let me follow up with that uh, and, and go to David next. Uh, so we had, when we think about like the shocks of the 70s, an array of policy responses. With the war in Ukraine, we've seen a different mix of policy responses, a number of ways in which we've used economic and financial sanctions, ways in which we impose, say, a, a price cap on Russian oil. How has that changed uh, the nature of the sort of economic and political relationships when it comes to the global energy system? How does it change where energy flows and the nature of those relationships? Thanks, and thanks for being here, and Megan. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's the only way I can get into Harvard is to, is to show up at a panel, but uh, nice to be here. Um, <laughs> well, um, I want to come back to the energy security question because I, I have a slightly different perspective, which I think energy security for every country has always been the ability to access affordable, reliable supplies <coughs> without coercion. And I would now I would say uh, without external coercion, and now I would add sustainable, sustainable supplies. But if you look around the world, the thing you need oil, gas, petroleum, electricity, critical minerals may change, it is very different in every region of the world right now. But if you have it and you can afford it, you're in good shape. If not, you're the Caribbean where you're uncompetitive because your fuel is too expensive. Now, we dealt with the 1970s by creating tools, strategic buffers, strategic stocks, um, changing from a mercantile system to a trading system where flows of oil and gas product can move about the country. Um, collective energy security, the creation of the, of the IEA. And so we had the tools to, to fight back on that. But what happened, despite 30 years of bipartisan policy talking to Europe about the need to have some of these tools for themselves, is the Europeans didn't do that. So what happened to Europe is they trusted Russia for 40% of their gas supply. They didn't have adequate storage. They didn't have buffer stocks. They didn't have a, a resilient system. And then when Russia cut off the gas, they had to go to everybody else's system. They had to go to the global LNG market and get really lucky that China was under COVID. It was a warm winter and that essentially the Asians were willing to redirect supply to Europe at least last year so that they could fill storage and get through the, get through the winter. But they weren't using the, the tools that they had before. Um, the tools which changed are the sanctions tools. So the European response to that crisis was, we are going to ban the importation of Russian oil. And the US was worried that if you took 6 million barrels of Russian oil completely off the market, the prices would go over 100, the economy would collapse, and that was going to be a bad thing. So they came up with this price cap, which nobody thought, including me, thought was going to work. Um, and it turns out that by saying that you cannot trade in Russian oil 
or use any Western services, insurance, or shipping, or anything else, unless it adheres to this cap, you empowered other countries who are not bound by the cap to strike very good deals and get significant discounts from, from Russia. So now, 90% of Russian oil is going to China and India, whereas it used to go to Europe. And Russian product is going to the Middle East and it's going to Latin America instead of going to, instead of going to Europe. And U.S. gas is going to, uh, to, uh, to, to Europe to substitute for some of that. And the Middle East has become more important. So the good news is these new tools are effective in that Russia has a significant deficit. Revenues are down almost a third year on year. Product is down even more. So you are impairing Russia's income through this price cap tool. The bad news is we have now completely shoved Russians into the hands of the Chinese, not so much India, who will buy the cheapest crude wherever it, it, can, it can do it, essentially permanently making them a gas station for, for, for China, um, along with Iran supporting them as well, and the Middle East, who everybody was trying to diversify away from 10 years ago, including China, is suddenly in the catbird seat because Europe needs them, China needs them, and they're the repository for all the Russian cash, which can't live anyplace else. So we have reordered flows. We have reordered sort of geopolitical relationships. We have a lot of stuff going where it has no business going on an economic basis. As Meg and I were talking about earlier, I mean, that's where we are right now. But how long can it last? Right. So, so Kelly, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in on what, how you interpret energy security today. But I'd also welcome your thoughts on how China, given that you've spent a lot of time both in the U.S. government and in your research thinking about China, how China plays into this and how they are engaging, whether it's they're moving in uh, with potentially with Russia economically, uh, as well as how they are starting to engage other parts of the world, especially the Middle East. Yeah. Well, uh, let me also add my thanks uh, to inviting me to be here. Um, it's fun to talk about these subjects and also with all of you. Uh, I would say, you know, to the first question of what's different about today, I think some things just fundamentally have not changed. I mean, every country in the world is naturally endowed with certain energy resources. They're dealt a hand, and they have to, you know, play that hand. Um, and I think that continues to be a real constraint for, for countries like Japan. Say. Um, and even China, you know, was not built a great hand, especially from a low carbon resource endowment. China's heavily endowed with, with coal. Um, India is heavily endowed with coal. Uh, the U.S. was blessed with a lot of oil and gas, right? Um, and so th those fundamentals really, really haven't changed. Of course, we've learned to exploit shale um, and, and, you know, made the United States much more energy secure. Um, I think also the, the response in the 70s um, was actually the first response, uh, you know, recently, which was turning to energy efficiency. As, and, I, and I think Europe did a fantastic job of that, um, of actually exploiting all possible energy efficiency measures, um, kind of at using that idea of efficiency as the first fuel. When I think about what really has changed, and this was something that evolved over time, back in the 70s, China wasn't even a major energy player, right? Um, and then as it became a major energy consumer, I would say the West or the OECD failed to bring China and India into the major um, international institution for consuming, major consuming nations, the International Energy Agency. It did become, I think, an associate member um, but it didn't embrace China and really bring China into the, into the institutional fold, which, you know, gets to this dynamic now with Russia. Um, but before I get to that, let me just mention two other things. Huge change in terms of progress on innovation and in clean energy technologies and, and the cost of cleaner alternatives um, and now the climate imperative. So I think we've got a lot of different dynamics that are making you know, the current situation actually harder to navigate. Um, so China, um, I, you know, everything David just said is correct. Um, I think it's true that post-invasion, uh, China increased its imports from Russia very substantially. 
Um, I couldn't find the latest, greatest data, but um, at least by 65% uh, in the first year. Uh, India increased its imports by 310% in the first year. Turkey, 198%. So we, we did see countries take advantage of the situation. <clears throat> Um, I think probably it's only in China's case that they made a geopolitical calculation here. I think everybody else was just buying, you know, cheap, mm -hmm. cheap energy. Um, and uh, what's what, another thing that's different about China is that China really increased um, exports to Russia of other types of things <clears throat> and kind of kept Russia alive in the global economy. So... Um, you know, I think that the role that China has been playing, which echoes the role it played post-invasion, post-Russian invasion of Crimea, is really to be the economic lifeline for Russia. And I think we, the West, kind of missed that China did that um, back in 2014. Um, and, and we're seeing this pattern play out all over again, um, but maybe at a, at a bigger scale. Um, so, so Megan, I'm... I want to ask you a couple of questions, but first I want to get your take on the role of institutions today when we think about energy security. So we've heard a little bit about how the IEA was formed in, in the 70s to deal with this, and it, it really was this, by then, then, the world's biggest consumers, the developed world, the world has changed a lot. Uh, to the extent we've seen institutions engaged in the war in Ukraine, I would say it's been coordination some through NATO. But when we think about it in the energy context, it seems that it's been more ad hoc among allies. Is that the future? Or do we think there's some value in either reinvigorating existing institutions? Is there an opportunity for institutional innovation where we bring in or create something new? Or do we think, you know, the world's messy and we're going to meddle, meddle through it with however our diplomats go, different capitals, and, and try to coordinate action? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question, and I'd like to be able to answer it in a different way than I'm going to answer it. So, um, you know, I'd like to be able to say we're at the dawn of a new set of institutions, and I think we'll see some of that. Like, some, we'll see some positive evolution. I'll talk about it. But the real defining element of this moment in time is the reemergence of great power competition. And so, you know, there's a role for cooperation, even in a landscape of great power competition, and that's important, and we hope climate falls in there, so that's not an unimportant conversation. But we have to understand that that's the dominant <clears throat> dynamic in the international system. And there's a lot of things that flow from that, and I think we should also expect that will be the dominant dynamic for some time to come. A decade, two decades, <clears throat> I'm not sure, it depends on a lot of things. But if that's the dominant dynamic, then it, it helps explain why institutions have not been so good at dealing with our global problems. Forget just about energy, but think about you know, the WHO during a global pandemic, or I guess that's redundant, but during a pandemic, it was not particularly useful in part hamstrung by the tensions between the US and China. Um, and you think about the financial, the global financial situation hasn't been addressed in a real collective sense in the way that it was back, um, you know, 12 years ago or so. So I think that we can only put so much hope into global institutions rising to the occasion or being reconstructed. You know, that said, um, I think the IEA could have, a, it has the capacity to be reimagined in a way that could be very useful for this moment in time. Um, some of the things that the IEA have done that have been incredibly useful is like provide more transparency into energy markets, provide more data um, accessible to everyone, and there'll be a really important role for exactly that in the critical mineral space. Now, the IEA, um, I think, is thinking about whether or not it can play this role. We'll have to make some changes to do so, but I think they're well positioned to do it. I don't think we need to create a new institution for that function. Um, but I also think, and now I'm getting a little bit off your question, but when we take the lens of, okay, we're in a world where the dominant dynamic is competition, um, and our institutions that rely on cooperation seem less effective to deal with global issues, um, what does that mean for how we deal with climate? So we think, obviously, climate is a global issue. It's a transnational issue. 
in the perfect world, we would deal with climate through cooperation because it is an issue that no one country can deal with. And so the COP was created and we've had, you know, more than two dozen of them and it's been a meaningful contribution. But that's relying on a lot of global cooperation. Is that still the right mechanism or the right approach to solve a global problem in a world that is defined by great power competition? And I would say the answer is probably not, that we have to figure out how to harness that competition to get us to our climate goals, rather than to hope that climate will remain this nice island of cooperation in a sea of global competition. And I think we've started to do that. Like, you know, I think the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is a demonstration of like trying to harness the competitive dynamic to address climate change rather than to exclusively hope on a co-op, hope uh, for a cooperative path to be fruitful. Uh, so I'd like to spend a little more time on China, but here thinking more about sort of the US-China relationship. We heard from Secretary Kerry uh, that it was one of the great challenges of our time uh, when he thinks about how we engage China. We have a deteriorating relationship uh, when we think about the US vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Um, when it comes to uh, climate and energy, um, are, are there any silver linings here? Do we see some potential for collaboration? Do we think that as we want to get China out of our supply chain with our new clean energy technologies, that that actually can foster sort of a positive dynamic, or does it just further exacerbate what is a weakening relationship? Um, even Kelly, looking at your faces, I think you each have thoughts on this issue. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, <clears throat> I think we've got um, we've gotten a little too hyperbolic on on China. Um, I, I think when I think about China and the climate space, I think about a couple of things. I think first, China is largely pursuing climate goals for its own self interest, which is a good thing. They internalize all the healthcare costs. They have vulnerability and have spent almost fifteen years trying to diversify supply, largely because they're worried about us blocking the Taiwan Straits and blocking their access to having energy. So that's where Turkmenistan comes from. That's where Russia comes from. That's why they've got LNG. So they're going to diversify for their own interests. They're going to move to cleaner sources of energy for their for their own interest, and that's a good thing. For fifteen years, when you were in government, when I was in government, Megan also a lot of what we did was make sure that China had access to the best available technology and all of the learning that we had to promote development because China decarbonizing was good for China and it was good for us. So we had a, you know, kind of a virtuous interest in doing that. That hasn't changed. In the trade space, I think we have to be really careful not to kneecap China as it is on its course to decarbonization. Now, they're going to have gas, they're going to have coal, back to your energy security question, because keeping the heat on, resilience, redundancy, that's job one for every government. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, we're not shutting down all of our plants also until we're sure we have something to replace it with. But if we decide we want to get into a trade war and prevent China from getting access to clean energy technologies, I just don't see how that helps the globe or us. This trade fight over solar panels, I don't get it. I mean, given the choice between cheap solar panels for everybody and enabling our solar business to, to go forward and trying to build a high-cost, inefficient solar panel manufacturing industry in the U.S., no. And everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, and everywhere else, right? It didn't work before. It's not going to work now. Why are we trying to do this? So I think that means that there is a common space. I think we can have, we can have both things. We can both build our own supply chain, not sell technologies which are of concern to, to China, or want, and to try and avoid a mercantile system where they're keeping stuff from us that we need. And that's the common space, is let's declare peace on clean energy clean energy trade, but we can do COCOM, we can do Cold War kind of stuff where, where we're really worried. I think we can really do both things. But if we don't do that, then I think we're going to put developing Asia in a huge bind where they really don't want to be in the middle of this food fight. And we're going to make everybody's costs of the energy transition more expensive. So this is not a particularly good season to have this conversation. But I think that's, I think there is common ground. And, and on your other question, it's, you know, we can't, you know, in the sanctions world, it's coalition of the willing, and the Chinese are in the club. <coughs> Major emitters forum, clean energy dialogue, they are in the club. So let's build clubs where we can work with the Chinese, and we'll build lots of other clubs where we're not going to work with the Chinese. And, you know, we're, we're big boy diplomats, we can, or big person diplomats, we can, we can do both. Okay, I think Megan wants to jump in real quick, and then I want to go to Kelly on this. <laughs> 
No, so I, I, you know, I like that response, David. Like that's, I like the sweetness and light. It can all happen response. No, it's an intelligent response. But I think, you know, is it possible, and maybe Kelly can address this, that we can get agreement with the Chinese on that? And when I think about from their perspective, they're currently contemplating putting export controls on solar technologies and machinery to the rest of the world um, in response to the United States putting export controls on high, highly sophisticated computer chips and other things that we did last October. So that was not a climate energy thing per se. And they're saying, well, what's our leverage? to respond to something that's really hamstrung stringing our industry. Well, our leverage is in the energy sphere. And so you can't tell us we're going to play nice in the sphere where you guys have leverage. We don't. But in other spheres, let's just go at it. I, I just think it's, it's, it's a hard point to sell diplomatically. And not surprisingly, I don't think the Chinese have, have, have bought it. So I, you know, I, I'd like to see that dynamic change. And I'm interested in you know, either in this room or on this panel, if there's, um, you know, real prospects or views that there is a real prospect for doing that. So, Kelly, you've yeah. been in the room when the U.S. and China could actually agree on something yeah. related to climate. So, so I'd love, love to hear your take. No, we're, well, we're in a different era now. But I, w I would say, um, I would say we're in the, right now we're in a vicious cycle, right? And I, I do think it's possible for us to stop the vicious cycle mm. and, and work on converting it back into a more virtuous a more virtuous cycle. I think there's two silver linings, Joe. Um, first would be that actually China is still honoring its commitments under the Paris Agreement and is on track to achieve its targets. And furthermore, you know, uh, has been putting in place quietly, uh, and I think most Westerners don't understand it, this confusingly named N plus one framework. Uh, which really lays the groundwork for a deep decarbonization strategy in China. And, um, you know, China had every excuse under the Trump administration to walk away from the Paris Agreement after the U.S. withdrew, and it didn't. It stayed the course. It stayed committed to uh, the UNFCC process, um, which, you know, is is far from perfect. <laughs> uh, but but they've stayed engaged in their, their uh, I think, honest, players in, in that process. And I'd say the second silver lining is that, as David said, China sees the clean energy transition to be very much in their own interest. Um, and they have made astonishing progress, actually. Um, if you think of it, when I was first doing my doctoral research in China in the 1990s, um, coal accounted for something like 75% of Chinese primary energy supply. And today it's down, even though they've quadrupled their energy consumption, it's down to, I think, 57%. So they've reduced coal consumption as a percentage of primary energy supply um, dramatically. And, and how did they do that? Largely through this really rapid expansion of uh, renewables, or what they call non-fossil, renewables and nuclear. Um, and as of last year, China accounted for 31% of global renewable energy generation, like way more than the U.S. So we have to give China some credit for, for the work they've done. And they saw this as an economic growth strategy. It's been good for them. It's been good for their economy. It's been good um, for job creation, you know, change, structural change in their economy. Um, so I think what's hard now is that we are getting into a kind of Hobbesian world. Our global institutions are breaking down. I mean, other ones I was jotting down that aren't working, like the WTO, for example, is not functioning right now in the way we need it to. Um, I do think that the competition between the US and China is healthy to some extent. I don't think we would have had the Inflation Reduction Act you know, without this sort of like threat of China. Um, and it's long overdue that the U.S. kind of come back and put its industrial like muscle and strength um, and create jobs uh, around a low carbon economy. Um, you know, if I, the, the one area I've been trying to advocate for cooperation in is in the area of development finance, um, because to me, 
Our biggest challenge is how are we going to help the rest of the world develop cleanly um, and help those rapidly growing emerging economies to navigate like this very difficult challenge of you know economic growth, reducing poverty, but doing it in a way that is that does not create a whole new wave of emissions. Um, and uh, the U.S. and China are like the two biggest financiers of development around the world in Europe. Um, and, you know, I don't think China has stepped up in a visible and concrete way in the provision of what we call climate finance. And it seems to me this ought to be an area where we could cooperate or at least coordinate um, to be able to work in so-called third-party countries, but like just imagine, you know, a country in Africa or a country in Southeast Asia um, and co-finance, you know, greener development projects. Um, I think the problem is really the U.S. side in that, uh, you know, that idea I think the Chinese are very open to, and I think there's no political openness to that on the U.S. side. Is that because of the political challenge of court? Coordinating China? with China, or, doing anything with China, or, or getting Congress to appropriate money. Both. <laughs> Both. Both. Okay. Well, I, actually, I think there's another okay. there's another issue there, which is um, institutional resistance. So, like you said, we didn't spend enough time trying to get China into the IEA. I actually spent when I was in, in government spent about a year and a half trying to get China into the IEA. Of course, you had to have the 60 day stockholding yeah. requirement. But the bottom line was China didn't want in the IEA because that was a, a Western European club Led. that had written all these rules. And so, and so why should they join in, have a stockholding requirement, and agree to release when we release? So they didn't want to have those restrictions. And associate membership was, was created because at least we can have the collaboration, information exchange kind of piece of that. And the same is true, I think, of the MDBs. I mean, because the... The IA, you know, the, the, the Chinese version of the World Bank. AIIB. AIIB, yeah. right. Which isn't really a bank, but sort of associated But with, which we refuse to join. But because it was <laughs> not more capital. I'll just remind you. Of right. Yes. But it, because it was not more capital, there was different rules. But you're, so maybe there's room for cooperation there. But China is a shill in the World Bank. Oh, yeah. So, so there's no reason why... You know, after that, we can't do better together on MDB reform and make more countries eligible and release more capital, which is in everybody's interest. And right. some of that goes through AIB. I'm all, I'm all for that. You know, but, but there is an area where if we're all serious about helping everybody else, where it's not about we want to employ our people in their country, mm -hmm. or we're going to insist that you buy our kit if you want our money. If we can remove some of those strings, that would be a great way to call everybody's bluff on whether we can work together on helping everybody else with climate finance. Can I be um, the, I'm like the skeptic. Eeyore, the skeptic, <laughs> the Darth Vader, whatever. Um, <laughs> Kelly, so, <Yeah. laughs> so um, it's interesting to me that you say that China would like to do co-financing with the U.S. So they have the, said. Okay, yeah. so what is what would be the benefit from their perspective? Because they get so much geopolitical benefit from financing projects in the developing world that if they co-finance something with us, they would, you know, maybe they still get the outcome of helping a country, but the geopolitical advantages would be greatly diminished. So why, why would China do that? Well, there's a lot of debt right now in the global economy. And I think the kind of cost sharing of all that debt I think would be welcomed by China. I mean, um, this is a big challenge, right? That China really arguably overextended itself in the BRI. Um, it holds a lot of debt. Uh, it's, I think, struggling now to kind of restart the BRI. And it, it's also under a lot of pressure from developing countries to provide climate finance. Um, so I think there's a number of reasons why. I mean, I don't know at what scale they're willing to do this, um, but, uh, you know, kind of risk sharing, cost sharing, debt sharing, uh, I think is, is probably the answer. So will you go before the U.S. Congress and say we should buy Chinese debt? No, I'm not talking about buying Chinese debt. I'm talking about helping developing countries navigate their terrible yeah, debt no. burden, even as they are trying to. No, no, I think that's and, and you know, coordinating with China on that response 
think that's an important talent. <clears throat> I just wonder if we should, we're in a world of don't force it. I mean, I think there are lots of things that we can do that don't require us to create multilateral clubs where we all have to agree to do it. So China can renegotiate itself. We can help. We can help on the developing country front without having to tie ourselves and have to agree with China. It's kind of like, you know, because that's the hardest way to do it. I think it would be enough if even individually as countries we, we yeah. just stepped up to help there. So I want to ask a couple of questions about time the time dimension. And then I want to open it up for questions from the audience. So please be ready for to chime in here in a few minutes. Uh, two questions about timing. Uh, and, and you don't have to take notes. I'll just do one at a time. Uh, <laughs> Taking notes on what Kelly said. Okay. <laughs> so, so one is, uh, as, as we sort of think about the relationship between <coughs> energy security and the energy transition, there's been a lot of discussion within uh, the EU that uh, this crisis from Russia invading Ukraine has ramped up the incentives to accelerate decarbonization, to get out of Russian gas, but just to get out of gas altogether. Um, in some sense, as we've already talked about, they kind of got lucky for a number of factors which are kind of perhaps one-offs, mild winter, low uh, economic demand from China, et cetera. Um, so the first question when we think about do these sort of near-term immediate stresses that clearly affect our politics. It can affect our willingness to either accelerate on decarbonization, but sometimes we've seen how energy security risk can sort of derail efforts to try to advance the climate agenda. Is the EU in a good position moving forward? Do they still, do you still see risk to them as we approach another winter? Um, how should we think about where the EU is uh, as we are now in the second year of this war, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know how long it's going to go on, but how do we think about how that's going to play out the near-term energy risk for Europe and what you think that might mean for how aggressive they can be decarbonizing their economies? I can, I can jump in. I've been, I've been looking at this one. I mean, first, they get an enormous amount of credit for changing policy really quickly. They put in a storage requirement and they filled storage. Um, they came up with both repower for you to add to fit for for 50, and so, uh, and they abandoned Russian oil and are cutting back on Russian gas. So big kudos to them. So, so that was good. They got lucky. Everybody is pretty complacent now about how well positioned Europe is for winter. I don't know where this is coming from. Um, I think they are still at serious risk, even though storage is high, because without LNG coming from other countries, there isn't excess supplies of LNG right now and not for a couple of years. So I think they're still, they're still at risk. I think they have also learned from the IRA that a mandate-based system, which is essentially what Fit for 50 is, does not accelerate investment or accelerate change. It's taking a lot longer, which is why they're now looking at IRA light in Europe as a way of creating incentives. The problem they have is that it's really expensive. And they don't have that money because they're also subsidizing everybody's electricity bills at an enormous cost. So either they redirect those subsidies into those incentives, or they've kind of got the wrong policy. So I think looking at eight years, I think they're doing a remarkable job, and they have it all have it all right. The next three to five years, I think it's going to be really it's going to be really hard. And the big decrease in demand that we saw in Europe did not come from heat pumps and great conservation. It came from deindustrialization, you know, because of high prices. And that is not a long-term strategy for political support for Ukraine, much less for, for Europe as an economy. So right direction, long runway. You want to jump on this? Sure. I mean, I agree with everything David said here. Um, and I do. I've recently been in Europe and I have been struck by exactly, you know, the word complacency, the sense of like, hey, we did a great job and they did. Um, but I think there's a lot of nervousness if you look at people who are really thinking about this on a day to day basis. And from a geopolitical perspective, I think this is one of the reasons why Vladimir Putin probably thinks he can still win this war, because his strategy has been all along to try to wait out the West. So as much division in Europe and in the transatlantic relationship as possible and his best tool is energy. And that turned out not to be nearly as easy as he thought. I think in the wake of the Afghan withdrawal and the deep divisions in NATO that followed that, I think his sense was 
this is going to be really easy. It turns out it's not so easy, but you know, the game is not over yet. So I think there's some real concerns about that. I also agree with David um, that in the longer term, I think you know, the direction is clear. The direction is clear, and I think that is where Europe is going to go. Um, but in the short term, the, that tension between energy security and climate action is, you know, very present. As, as David, I think you just pointed out, Europe spent a, about a trillion dollars subsidizing energy consumption last year. You think, like, that's not what you want to do when you are trying to bring about an energy transition. So I think politically, that's just going to be hard. It's going to be hard for Europe to subsidize another trillion dollars um, in the next in the next um, year. So I think that the challenges remain. We have to keep in mind at the end of the day, the things we can do to address energy security can also, you know, many of those same things can also help us deal with the climate. So there is a set of things that can be done which can move us both in that direction. A lot of it has to do with efficiency and conservation, which, you know, it comes in different different packages. We have to get the right one um, rather than the deindustrialization one, which is politically not um, helpful. So the last question I have about time is thinking a little bit more long term as we move through the energy transition. If we're actually making progress decarbonizing the global economy, we'll be consuming less oil, but more the, a larger share of that oil is going to be coming from the Middle East. <clears throat> and we have... Um, Let's say I'll be diplomatic, which isn't easy as an economist. I'll be diplomatic and say the U.S.-Saudi relationship seems a little rocky right now. Uh, we're going to have an evolving relationship if OPEC is producing more and more of the world's oil as we're trying to move off of oil. Uh, how should we think about, is this just sort of a short-term hiccup in a relationship? Do we think there's a fundamental shift where Saudi is starting to look to other uh, 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 major powers uh, to engage with e either economically or militarily. How should we think about the U.S.-Saudi relationship now, and what does that mean for this kind of transition where the world might see as OPEC production swings, big swings in the price of oil, even if it's a smaller share of our energy consumption on this transition path? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, so I was in Saudi Arabia six weeks ago. I hadn't been there since COVID and um, was struck by a whole range of things, most pertinent to your comments, Joe, is just the quality of the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. And I've been going to Saudi Arabia for 15 years or so. Um, and that relationship, I think, is at a, um, a real low. But I think, if I sense correctly, I think... Washington is beginning to understand what's happening. And I think, you know, last October, we saw the Saudis make an unexpected oil um, cut, which the Biden administration felt was a betrayal, I think is maybe the right word. It led to a huge public stink. It wasn't helpful for anyone. Um, and I think the Washington has begun to realize that its relationship with Saudi Arabia is not going back to to the old days, that we're in a different geopolitical environment. David began by talking about shifting energy flows and how that's changing geopolitical <clears throat> relations. So Saudi Arabia still cares deeply about its relationship with the United States, and there's things that the United States can only provide for Saudi Arabia. But it also cares deeply about its relationship with China, which is its largest market. And it cares deeply about its relationship with Russia because it believes that it will need Russian cooperation to help manage the oil market for the foreseeable future. And there's definitely been a shift in Saudi thinking. Ten years ago, you know, I was having conversations where people were freaked out by the idea that the world was going to move away from oil. And now they think like, well, that, that's too bad for the Nigerians and the Angolans and the Ecuadorians. And, but, you know, for the Gulfies, we're going to be producing all of the oil that the world is going to continue to consume. So they feel like they're in a much better place. They're actually doing a lot of investment into renewable energy. So they feel like they're hedging their bet. But they just feel like they're hedging their relationships and that the relationship with Washington just has to be less emotional, um, more transactional. And that means they're going to do a lot of things that we would rather they didn't do. And we have to kind of get used to the fact that they're a sovereign power. And um, in, so it's, it, the, the nature of the relationship is going to be different. Um, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, I'm not as worried about the future because, uh, as Megan has pointed out, you know, the future of Saudi and OPEC oil is not 
in the West is in the developing East. So it's, it's not all about us anymore. We're self-sufficient in hydrocarbons. We'll get physical supply, even if it's expensive. So if they really want to cut production and drive prices up, they're going to kill their future markets. So that gives me, you know, the, the, the quasi-economist to me takes a little, <laughs> a little comfort that. Second is there's no replacement for the U.S. as the guarantor of, uh, of Saudi security. Um, and the right to question how deep that commitment goes. But China is not stepping in with security assistance. And so as long as they're not getting along with Iran, they kind of still need us. So I'm not too worried about that. And third, if it hadn't been for Mohammed bin Salman engineering the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, we would be cheering this modernizing reformer inside there. You know, the fact that he locked everybody up in the hotel for a while, you know, maybe we could let that one go. But to Khashoggi, we can't. You know, and so they did this to themselves. And they are right that the U.S. is disinvesting in the Middle East. We don't want to be in the middle of these wars. We are not very successful at forging peace. The Iranians are not even interested in... Uh, you know, the JCPOA and negotiating more. So if they can find a way to get along better with their neighbors and calm the world down so we have to give them less security assistance, good on them. Let me open it up for questions from the audience. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Diego Osorio. I work on climate and security issues. And um, just wanted to look at, the, at the, the title of the session, International Security, energy security and the energy transition. And I'm wondering about climate change and security in terms of what uh, Special Envoy Kerry mentioned, the migration problems, the fact that our institutional framework is not capable of handling the current level of fragmentation of the social level in many parts of the world. Imagine that at scale with a major effect in terms of climate change. And NATO is actually quite focused on that particular angle of climate security. What's going to happen with the major wars? And um, we're concerned that we don't necessarily have neither the tools nor the conceptualization of the problem in the way that we can handle it. So is that something that we should include in this particular framework? I mean, climate change and security, the wars of the future, the conflicts of the future, the scale, the type, the people involved, are we ready for that kind of stuff? So I think our problem is actually more of an economic problem. Um, I, I think we are already seeing that so many countries cannot bear any more major climate disasters, right? And as, as, as the next billion dollar disaster hits the next country, whether it's Pakistan or Nigeria or Ghana, I think Ghana's having ter ter terrible flooding right now, is creating more and more of this debt burden, more and more struggles um, to recover economically. And yes, that can lead to desperation and migration, um, but but we're I'm less worried about you know actually having um, military interventions and more worried about uh, the sort of debt poverty lack of development you know economic frustration of the developing world and and we are already witnessing. Uh, a very extreme version of this, you know, in the last couple of years. Look at Pakistan, you know, so you can start to see the sort of um, collapse of the state because that, that, and there is a climate role there where you're just having such significant disasters <laughs> in countries that don't have the institutions and the economic resilience to be able to come back from them. And then our failure of our international institutions to be able to, to help these countries. I'm more worried about that than the need for military intervention from a kind of national security point of view. Joe, thanks. Hi, Jim Matheson. I'm the faculty here and a climate entrepreneur investor and long ago deployed as a naval officer in the Middle East and Cold War time, so this is near and dear to my heart. I'm wondering, Kelly, building on your comment, how do we reorient and reorganize ourselves as a country to not think about the being the, the police person of the world, but rather thinking geoeconomically and competing and deploying energy in the form of technology and climate solutions, adaptation solutions? And we've been notoriously not effective at that, I think, as a country. So I'm wondering, how do we reorient and what do we need to do to make that happen? Which I think is good for everybody, and maybe it makes the U.S.-China competition a positive rather than a negative. Big question, but I'm wondering if there's some practical things that we could do. I would say three. 
This be is what more... you did with your, when you were in your job, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what you wrote about so uh, eloquently in your, uh, in your, in your book. Nice way doing it. Well, I, I think the, um, I mean, be more helpful, make more friends, um, and, um, and I think, you know, kind of, a, and deal with, I think, the economic issues of helping people. I mean, what we, in terms of being helpful, the U.S. is an energy superpower and incredibly uncomfortable with being an energy superpower. So one thing we could do is actually provide alternative supply to people, which is what we're doing with gas, being helpful to Europe, being helpful to Asia. Frankly, it's true in, in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of, by the Caribbean and Central America too. Be a little less, less embarrassed. Be promising that we will be there in the future. We're even selling LNG to China. I mean, so we're getting along in that space. So be more helpful even while we deal with the climate issues. The second is we've got to walk the walk on the money. This is, I mean, John Kerry pointed out today, you know, all these migration issues that you pointed out and things like that, all this has the same answer, which is we have to be more helpful in the developing world which gets 10% of the climate finance investment right now in, in technical assistance, framework, concessional finance, and equity. You know, it's for you know, just a little slice of equity in those investors so that they can have more sustainable systems which will reduce migration pressure, climate, and we could be more useful. Now, if we weren't afraid of trade, you know, as Meg and I were talking about this earlier, we actually had this figured out with TPP and TTIP. We were supposed to have like these big trade agreements, and we had something which was actually useful to countries, which they could participate in, which could help them grow. Now nobody's for that anymore. But you know, my one wish, you know, we'd probably go back to embracing trade after we get our industrial base in order. So I think that's how we do it. We have to actually do something helpful. If I can just add one point, uh, my, my climate policy lab is working in 10 major emerging economies. And as I have gone to those, interrupted, of course, during the pandemic, I'm so struck by the absence of the U.S., the visible you know, absence of the U.S. in providing development solutions in these countries. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Ethiopia. And, you know, you literally feel like you're in China. The subway was built by the Chinese. It's like branded by the Chinese, you know? All the buses are Chinese. Like I kept having this deja vu, like where am I? Am I in Beijing or am I in Addis Ababa? So I think what David is saying is right. Like we actually need to show up. We actually need to be helpful. We need to actually deliver um, development solutions and they need to be clean if we want to solve the climate issue. Thank you. You have a burning oh. question right there, Joe. Yes. Uh, Bob Grady, I served in the White House under President George H.W. Bush and that administration and uh, taught environmental and energy international policy in Stanford Business School for many years. Um, I was struck by Megan's comment about the Chinese perhaps uh, implementing export controls over solar technology and <clears throat> even other forms of industrial technology. I guess having served for President Bush Sr., I'm old enough to remember two guys named Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. And uh, um, the original Kissingerian insight was pretty, you know, interesting, which is if in, in, great, in the great global superpower game, if you're at a triangular table, you'd rather be on the side where it's two against one instead of one against two. And it seems that one of the interesting features of our current politics, or both sides are involved in this, both Republicans and Democrats are involved in this competition of who can kick more dirt on the shoes of the Chinese and sort of uh, uh, prove that they're tougher on them. And yet I wonder if that has an international energy security implication for ourselves. Namely, some of the stuff that we've done, we, we still have tariffs on Chinese imports, very substantial tariffs that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously President Trump uh, put in place but have not been removed. Um, and we move from not importing or not exporting sensitive military technology to not, now not exporting basically routine low function semiconductors or semiconductor cap equipment that would enable them to make <clears throat> routine kind of types of chips. And so the question is the, the, the net, you know, the one thing we've succeeded in doing, I think Xi Jinping has convinced himself that, wow, that happened under both parties. And so at the exact moment when Putin has invaded Ukraine rather clumsily, perhaps creating an opening, we've done everything we can to drive Xi Jinping into the arms of Putin and vice versa, and Putin into his arms. And so the question is, in doing that, should we be considering, I mean, this is a, it's a sort of bipartisan problem, as I said, but 
things like removing the tariffs or not being not having export controls on things that don't matter, trying to find ways to cooperate with the Chinese, because our own international, you know, when you talk about energy security, if we're going to have, for example, 67% of our fleet be electric cars in, in 10 years, um, you know, China processes, you know, half of the copper in the world, smelts half, you know, almost half the copper in the world, and over 60% of all the lithium in the world. So we will reduce our own ability to achieve that kind of objective and our own, therefore, our own energy security if we're just going to have this kind of gratuitous trade war, as David said, you know, talk about trade with China. Well, I, I, you know, at first, post-invasion, I'm like calling all my Chinese colleagues and getting, you know, I was so shocked by the Chinese response and Xi Jinping's response. And um, I really do think your theory is correct, that the Chinese and particular Xi Jinping feels, and I know this is hard for American audiences to hear and understand, feel under siege, feel that, you know, the U.S. has explicitly declared China enemy number one. And so exactly to your triangle point, you know, Xi Jinping feels stronger. So ironic, you know, given the historic reluctance of the Chinese to rely on Russia, feels safer, you know, allied with Russia right now than with the United States. You know, I think we have to reflect on that. Did we do that on purpose? Um, or is Xi Jinping, you know, is this more ideological? I'm not sure. Uh, but we're certainly not holding out a hand anymore, right? We're, we're sending every signal that we cannot be a trusted trade partner. We cannot be a trusted security partner. We cannot be a trusted, I mean, I don't know, name something, you know, where we can partner with you. There's nothing right now. So I do feel like we have sent every signal, intentional or not, that, that drives him, you know, into Russia's arms. I agree with you. Let me take one final question. Oh, I'm sorry, Megan. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, just please. 30 seconds. Just, of course, um, I think that's an adequate description of how the Chinese feel. I yeah. think on the American side, yeah, yeah. there's the opposite feeling. <laughs> I can do feeling. that one, too. Yeah, the I can do that one, too. You know, that... Uh, who was it that suspended the conversations between the U.S. and China? It was China. Well, why in reaction to Pelosi going to talk? I mean, it like it goes back and forth and back and forth. And the question is, is it possible to get out of the cycle? And, you know, I do think um, I do think that's what both Washington and Beijing would like. It just seems extremely hard to bring down the temperature and get something positive on the table. But, you know, hope springs eternal. Like in the last week, um, you saw the Chinese, you saw Xi Jinping call President Zelensky in Ukraine, offer substantial uh, reconstruction benefits when a peace comes, um, that the Chinese look like they want to be part of a solution. They're probably the only actor that can bring Russia to the table, Russia to the table. The, Chinese actually voted for a UN resolution last week that condemned Russian aggression in Ukraine and Georgia. Like, that's a step. So, and then Washington came out and said, like, hey, anybody wants to help bring peace to Ukraine, we're, we want to work with them. So I think there will always be opportunities, and hopefully the, the climate can be such that they can be tried and that something will eventually work. You know, unfortunately, we're going into our political season, and that's going to get tougher. I was in Washington three hours ago. And literally, you know, people, someone said to me, if you have a modicum, not me personally, but if one has a modicum of political ambition, you would not say anything positive about China anywhere. Um, and so that is going to be something that, you know, I think it, it, it's helpful for people outside of government who know the stakes to actually try to make sure that the conversation is as open as it can be. Yes, so I know there's still more hands, uh, but apologies, it is 3.30. So I would suggest that if you want to come up and have a conversation with panelists who can remain, that's great. I know Kelly has to run back. Uh, so Kelly, thank you for joining us. David, thank you for joining us. Megan, thank you for joining us. And please join me. And